Welcome to the channel. Here we are, TOEFL listening practice questions and answers, over two hours of practice, and congratulations just by clicking this video. It means that you're serious about your TOEFL score. And you're gonna feel great after you finish this two hours of practice because you're gonna know exactly what type of question types to prepare for on test day. And you're also gonna feel better about your listening skills when you listen to academic passages. We're gonna talk about a lot of academic passages and you're gonna feel comfortable and confident when you go to listen to these types of lectures on test day. So let me just say some of the differences between this practice and TOEFL test, the actual TOEFL test. First, shorter passages. These passages are all academic lectures, but they're between one to three minutes. You'll have 30 seconds to answer each question they show up after the passage. So remember, on test day, you don't see the questions until after the passage. It's the same here. There'll be two questions per listening passage, and you could check your answers in the PDF in the description below. A few differences about how it looks. So the TOEFL IBT will look like this. They will show you some words that are important and that might be hard to understand while you're listening. And we do the same thing here. It'll look like this. When the passage finishes, they give you the question types. It looks like this on the TOEFL IBT, uh, but here it'll just look pretty simple like this, and you'll have two questions after each passage. We're gonna talk about a lot of different topics, and these are all the academic topics, so you might feel more confident in some than others. So it's good practice, so you get used to all the different types of academic passages that you might see on test day. There are eight different question types. I talk about them in another lecture that I will link in the description below. So if you want to know more about these question types, you can check out that video. My name is Josh. I'm the head instructor of TST Prep, an online TOEFL school where our mission is simple, help you get your TOEFL score as quickly and as easily as possible. TSTprep.com for a free and complete practice test if you haven't done so already. Uh, and that's, that's the actual TOEFL test, but this is practice. Let me stop talking. Let's get into the TOEFL listening practice right now. Good luck, and I'll see you in there. Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Human movement includes not only actions at the joints of the body, but also the motion of individual organs and even individual cells. As you read these words, red and white blood cells are moving throughout your body, muscle cells are contracting and relaxing to maintain your posture and to focus your vision, and glands are secreting chemicals to regulate body functions. Your body is coordinating the action of entire muscle groups to enable you to move air into and out of your lungs, to push blood throughout your body, and to propel the food you've eaten through your digestive tract. Now, conscientiously, of course, you contract your skeletal muscles to move the bones of your skeleton to get from one place to another and to carry out all of the activities of your daily life. Question 1. What actions of human movement are made consciously? Two. What does the lecturer imply when she says this? As you read these words, red and white blood cells are moving throughout your body, muscle cells are contracting and relaxing to maintain your posture and to focus your vision, and glands are secreting chemicals to regulate body functions.
Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Okay, so German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen, born in 1845, died in 1923, was experimenting with electrical current when he discovered that a mysterious and invisible ray would pass through his flesh but leave an outline of his bones on a screen coated with a metal compound. Then, in 1895, Röntgen made the first durable record of the internal parts of a living human, an X-ray image, as it came to be called, of his wife's hand. Scientists around the world quickly began their own experiments with X-rays, and by 1900, X-rays were widely used to detect a variety of injuries and diseases. Okay, so in 1901, Röntgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize for Physics for his work in this field. Now, the X-ray is a form of high-energy electromagnetic radiation with a short wavelength, capable of penetrating solids and ionizing gases. As they are used in medicine, X-rays are emitted from an X-ray machine and directed toward a specifically treated metallic plate placed behind the patient's body. Now, the beam of radiation results in darkening of the X-ray plate. X-rays are slightly impeded by soft tissues, which show up as gray on the X-ray plate, whereas hard tissues such as bone largely block the rays, producing a light-toned shadow. Thus, X-rays are best used to visualize hard body structures such as teeth and bones. Now, like many forms of high-energy radiation, however, X-rays are capable of damaging cells and initiating changes that can lead to cancer. This danger of excessive exposure to X-rays was not fully appreciated for many years after their widespread use. Question: What are X-rays best used for? Why does the professor say this? This danger of excessive exposure to X-rays was not fully appreciated for many years after their widespread use. Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Now, human anatomy is the scientific study of the body's structures. Some of these structures are very small and can only be observed and analyzed with the assistance of a microscope. Other larger structures can readily be seen, manipulated, measured, and weighed. The word anatomy comes from a Greek root that means to cut apart. Human anatomy was first studied by observing the exterior of the body and observing the wounds of soldiers and other injuries. But later, physicians were allowed to dissect bodies of the dead to augment their knowledge. Now, when a body is dissected, its structures are cut apart in order to observe their physical attributes and their relationships to one another. Dissection is still used in medical schools, anatomy courses, and in pathology labs. Question: What is the lecture mainly about?
Why does the professor mention the Greek root of the word anatomy? Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. A human body consists of trillions of cells organized in a way that maintains distinct internal compartments. Now these compartments keep body cells separated from external environmental threats and keep the cells moist and nourished. They also separate internal body fluids from the countless microorganisms that grow on body surfaces, including the lining of certain tracts or passageways. Now, the intestinal tract, for example, is home to even more bacteria cells than the total of all human cells in the body. Yet these bacteria are outside the body and cannot be allowed to circulate freely inside the body. Cells, for example, have a cell membrane, also referred to as the plasma membrane, that keeps the intracellular environment, the fluids and organelles, separate from the extracellular environment. Blood vessels keep blood inside a closed circulatory system, and nerves and muscles are wrapped in connective tissue sheaths that separate them from surrounding structures. In the chest and abdomen, a variety of internal membranes keep major organs, such as the lungs, heart, and kidneys, separate from others. Question: What is the topic of this lecture? Why does the professor talk about the intestinal tract? Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Now, the position of the heart in the chest allows for individuals to apply an emergency technique known as cardiopulmonary resuscitation, commonly referred to as CPR, if the heart of a patient should stop. By applying pressure with the flat portion of one hand on the sternum. It is possible to manually compress the blood within the heart enough to push some of the blood within it into the major arteries. Now, this is particularly critical for the brain, as irreversible damage and death of neurons occur within minutes of loss of blood flow. Current standards call for a compression of the chest at least five centimeters deep and at a rate of 100 compressions per minute. At this stage, the emphasis is on performing high-quality chest compressions rather than providing artificial respiration. CPR is generally performed until the patient regains heart activity or is declared dead by an experienced healthcare professional. Now, when performed by untrained individuals, CPR can result in broken ribs and can inflict additional severe damage on the patient. It is also possible, if the hands are placed too low, to manually drive the xiphoid process into the liver, a consequence that may prove fatal for the patient. Now, proper training is essential. This proven life-sustaining technique is so valuable that virtually all medical personnel, as well as concerned members of the public, should be certified and routinely recertified in its application. Question. 
What does the professor imply about the utility of CPR training? What can happen if the hands are placed too low on the sternum when performing CPR? Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an astronomy class. An association is a group of extremely young stars, typically containing 5 to 50 hot, bright stars scattered over a region of space some 100 to 500 light years in diameter. As an example, most of the stars in the constellation Orion form one of the nearest stellar associations. Associations also contain hundreds to thousands of low-mass stars, but these are much harder to see. The presence of really hot and bright stars indicates that star formation in the association has occurred in the last million years or so. Since O stars, stars that are over a million times brighter than our own sun, go through their entire lives in only about a million years, they would not still be around unless star formation occurred recently. It is therefore not surprising that associations are found in regions rich in the gas and dust required to form new stars. It's like a brand new building still surrounded by some of the construction materials used to build it, and with the landscape still showing signs of construction. Question. What is the professor implying when she says this? It's like a brand new building still surrounded by some of the construction materials used to build it, and with the landscape still showing signs of construction. What are O stars? Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an astronomy class. Born in 1910 in India, Subramanian Chandra Sekhar, known as Chandra to his friends and colleagues, grew up in a home that encouraged scholarship and an interest in science. His uncle, C. V. Raman, was a physicist who won the 1930 Nobel Prize. As a precocious student, Chandra tried to read as much as he could about the latest ideas in physics and astronomy, although obtaining technical books was not easy in India at the time. He finished college at age 19 and won a scholarship to study in England. It was during the long boat voyage to get to graduate school that he first began doing calculations about the structure of white dwarf stars. 
Chandra developed his ideas during and after his studies as a graduate student, showing that white dwarfs with masses greater than 1.4 times the mass of the sun cannot exist. His calculations soon brought him into conflict with certain distinguished astronomers, including Sir Arthur Eddington, who publicly ridiculed Chandra's ideas. At a number of meetings of astronomers, such leaders in the field as Henry Norris Russell refused to give Chandra the opportunity to defend his ideas, while allowing his more senior critics lots of time to criticize them. Yet Chandra persevered, writing books and articles about his theories, which turned out not only to be correct, but to lay the foundation for much of our modern understanding of the death of stars. In 1983, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics for this early work. Question. Why does the professor mention other astronomers, such as Sir Arthur Eddington and Henry Norris Russell? Why does the professor say this? In 1983, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics for this early work. Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an astronomy class. Now, a supernova is basically when a star explodes. It occurs during the last stage of a star's life and usually only occurs in large stars like white dwarfs. While these stellar explosions may appear beautiful to spectators on Earth, they also have terrible consequences for nearby stars and planets. Now suppose a life form has the misfortune to develop around a star that happens to lie near a massive star destined to become a supernova. Such life forms may find themselves extinct when the harsh radiation and high energy particles from the neighboring star's explosion reach their world. Life may well have formed around a number of pleasantly stable stars only to be wiped out because a massive nearby star suddenly went supernova. Just as children born in a war zone may find themselves the unjust victims of their violent neighborhood, life too close to a star that goes supernova may fall prey to having been born in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, what is a safe distance to be from a supernova explosion? Now, a lot depends on the violence of the particular explosion, what type of supernova it is, and what level of destruction we are willing to accept. Calculations suggest that a supernova less than 50 light years away from us would certainly end all life on Earth, and that even one 100 light years away would have drastic consequences for the radiation levels here. One minor extinction of sea creatures about 2 million years ago on Earth may actually have been caused by a supernova at a distance of about 120 light years. Now, the good news is that there are, at present, no massive stars that promise to become supernova within 50 light years of the sun. Question. According to the professor, what may have caused the extinction of sea creatures about 2 million years ago?
Why does the professor say this? Just as children born in a war zone may find themselves the unjust victims of their violent neighborhood, life too close to a star that goes supernova may fall prey to having been born in the wrong place at the wrong time. Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an astronomy class. Although many supernova explosions in our own galaxy have gone unnoticed, a few were so spectacular that they were clearly seen and recorded by sky watchers and historians at the time. We can use these records, going back 2,000 years, to help us pinpoint where the exploding stars were and thus where to look for their remnants today. The most dramatic supernova was observed in the year 1006. It appeared in May as a brilliant point of light visible during the daytime, perhaps 100 times brighter than the planet Venus. It was bright enough to cast shadows on the ground during the night and was recorded with amazement and fear by observers all over Europe and Asia. No one had seen anything like it before. Astronomers David Clark and Richard Stevenson have looked through records from around the world to find more than 20 reports of the 1006 supernova. This has allowed them to determine with some accuracy where in the sky the explosion occurred. They place it in the modern constellation of Lupus. At roughly the position they have determined, we find a supernova remnant, now quite faint. From the way its materials are expanding, it indeed appears to be about a thousand years old. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? What is implied by the professor about supernovas? Directions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an astronomy class. Most stars end their lives as stars known as white dwarfs or neutron stars. Now when a very massive star ends its life, not even the repulsion between densely packed neutrons can support the core against its own weight. If the remaining mass of the star's core is more than about three times that of the sun, Scientific theory predicts that no known force can stop it from collapsing forever. Gravity simply overwhelms all other forces and crushes the middle of the star until it occupies a small area. Now, a star in which this occurs may become one of the strangest objects ever predicted by theory, a black hole. To understand what a black hole is like and how it influences its surroundings, we need a theory that can describe the action of gravity under such extreme circumstances. To date, our best theory of gravity is the general theory of relativity, which was put forward in 1916 by Albert Einstein. Question 1. What does the professor imply about black holes?
Why does the professor say this? Now, when a very massive star ends its life, not even the repulsion between densely packed neutrons can support the core against its own weight. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a chemistry class. Now, when a liquid vaporizes in a closed container, gas molecules cannot escape. As these gas phase molecules move randomly about, they will occasionally collide with the surface of molecules of the condensed phase, and in some cases, these collisions will result in the molecules re-entering the condensed phase. The change from the gas phase to the liquid is called condensation. Now, when the rate of condensation becomes equal to the rate of vaporization, neither the amount of the liquid nor the amount of the vapor in the container changes. The vapor in the container is then said to be in equilibrium with the liquid. Keep in mind that this is not a static situation, as molecules are continually exchanged between the condensed and gaseous phases. Question: What is the lecture mainly about? What is the definition of condensation? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a chemistry class. So decompression sickness, or the bends, is an effect of the increased pressure of the air inhaled by scuba divers when swimming underwater at considerable depths. In addition to the pressure exerted by the atmosphere, divers are subjected to additional pressure due to the water above them. Therefore, the air inhaled by a diver while submerged contains gases that exist at higher levels of pressure within the water, and these gases dissolve into the diver's blood. Now, as the diver ascends to the surface of the water, the pressure of the water decreases. If the ascent is too rapid, the gases escaping from the diver's blood may form bubbles that can cause a variety of symptoms, ranging from rashes and joint pain to paralysis and death. To avoid decompression sickness, divers must ascend from depths at relatively slow speeds, about 10 or 20 meters per minute, or otherwise make several decompression stops, pausing for several minutes at given depths during the ascent. Question: What is the lecture mainly about?
What happens if a diver ascends to the water's surface too rapidly? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a chemistry class. Cooking is essentially synthetic chemistry that happens to be safe to eat. There are a number of examples of acid-based chemistry in the culinary world. One example is putting lemon juice or vinegar, both of which are acids, on cooked fish. Now it turns out that fish have volatile amines in their system, which are neutralized by the acidic lemon or vinegar. This reduces the odor of the fish and also adds a sour taste that we seem to enjoy. Pickling is a method of preserving vegetables using a naturally produced acidic environment. The vegetable, such as a cucumber, is placed in a sealed jar submerged in a brine solution. The brine solution favors the growth of beneficial bacteria and suppresses the growth of harmful bacteria. The beneficial bacteria feed on starches in the cucumber and produce lactic acid as a waste product in a process called fermentation. Now, the lactic acid eventually increases the acidity of the brine to a level that kills any harmful bacteria. Without the harmful bacteria consuming the cucumbers, they are able to last much longer than if they were unprotected. The pickling process ultimately changes the flavor of the vegetables, making them taste sour. Question: Why does the professor discuss putting lemon or vinegar on fish? What is implied about pickling from the lecture? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a chemistry class. The mining of seawater for magnesium, formulation of over-the-counter medicines such as antacids, and treating the presence of minerals in your home's water supply are just a few of the many tasks that involve controlling the equilibrium between a slightly soluble ionic solid and an aqueous solution of its ions. Now, I know that sounds rather complicated, but let me explain. In some cases, we want to prevent dissolution from occurring. Tooth decay, for example, occurs when the calcium in our teeth dissolves. The dissolution process is aided when bacteria in our mouth feasts on the sugars in our diets to produce lactic acid, which reacts with calcium. Now, preventing this dissolution prevents tooth decay. On the other hand, sometimes we want a substance to dissolve. We want the calcium carbonate in a chewable antacid, the kind you may take when you have a stomach ache. We want this antacid to dissolve because the ions produced in this process help soothe an upset stomach. Question: Why does the professor discuss tooth decay?
Why does the professor say this? The mining of seawater for magnesium, formulation of over-the-counter medicines such as antacids, and treating the presence of minerals in your home's water supply are just a few of the many tasks that involve controlling the equilibrium between a slightly soluble ionic solid and an aqueous solution of its ions. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a chemistry class. Now scientists discovered that naturally fluorinated water could be beneficial to your teeth, and so it became common practice to add fluoride to drinking water. Toothpastes and mouthwashes also contain amounts of fluoride. Unfortunately, excess fluoride can negate its advantages. Natural sources of drinking water in various parts of the world have varying concentrations of fluoride, and places where that concentration is high are prone to certain health risks where there is no other source of drinking water. The most serious side effect of excess fluoride is the bone disease skeletal fluorosis. When excess fluoride is in the body, it can cause the joints to stiffen and the bones to thicken. It can severely impact mobility and can negatively affect the thyroid gland. Skeletal fluorosis is a condition that over 2.7 million people suffer from across the world. Question: What is the professor mainly discussing? What does the professor imply about fluoride? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. All right. Now, social psychologists have documented that feeling good about ourselves and maintaining positive self-esteem is a powerful motivator of human behavior. In the United States, members of the predominant culture typically think very highly of themselves and view themselves as good people who are above average on many desirable traits. Often, our behavior, attitudes, and beliefs are affected when we experience a threat to our self-esteem or positive self-image. Back in the 1950s, psychologist Leon Festinger defined cognitive dissonance as psychological discomfort arising from holding two or more inconsistent attitudes, thoughts, beliefs, or opinions. Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance states that when we experience a conflict in our behaviors, attitudes, or beliefs that runs counter to our positive self-perceptions, we experience psychological discomfort. For example, if you believe smoking is bad for your health, but you continue to smoke, you experience conflict between your belief and behavior. Question. Why does the professor discuss people from the United States?
Why does the professor say this? For example, if you believe smoking is bad for your health, but you continue to smoke, you experience conflict between your belief and behavior. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. So researchers have tested many persuasion strategies that are effective in selling products and changing people's attitude, ideas, and behaviors. One effective strategy is the foot in the door technique. Using the foot in the door technique, the persuader gets a person to agree to a small favor or to buy a small item. Only to later request a larger favor or purchase of a bigger item. The foot in the door technique was demonstrated in a study by Friedman and Fraser in the 1960s, in which participants who agreed to post a small sign in their yard or sign a petition were more likely to agree to put a large sign in their yard than people who declined the first request. Research on this technique also illustrates the principle of consistency. Um, our past behavior often directs our future behavior, and we have a desire to maintain consistency once we have committed to a behavior. A common application of foot in the door is when teens ask their parents for a small permission and then asking them for something larger. Having granted the smaller request increases the likelihood that parents will acquiesce with the later larger request. So, how would a store owner use the foot in the door technique to sell you an expensive product? For example, say that you're buying the latest model smartphone, and the salesperson suggests you purchase the best data plan. You agree to this. The salesperson then suggests a bigger purchase: the three-year extended warranty. After agreeing to the smaller request, you are more likely to also agree to the larger request. You may have encountered this if you have bought a car. When salespeople realize that a buyer intends to purchase a certain model, they might try to get the customer to pay for many additional features, like、uh, leather seating. Question: How did Friedman and Fraser demonstrate the foot in the door technique? Why does the professor say this? How would a store owner use the foot in the door technique to sell you an expensive product? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. In normative social influence, people conform to the group norm to fit in,、uh, to feel good, and to be accepted by the group. However, with informational social influence, people conform because they believe the group is competent and has the correct information, particularly when the task or situation is ambiguous. In one famous study, known as the Ash Conformity Studies, participants were placed together in a room and asked to look at a drawing of a clear and simple straight line. 
The participants in the study did not have to rely on the group for information. Anyone who saw the picture knew it was a straight line. So, when the other participants, who were secretly researchers taking part of the study, all agreed that the line was a curved line and not a straight line, one studied participant actually agreed with the other people in the group, even though it was clear that they were wrong. In other words, participants complied to fit in and avoid ridicule, an instance of normative social influence. An example of informational social influence may be what to do in an emergency situation. Now imagine you're in a movie theater watching a film and what seems to be smoke comes in the theater from under the emergency exit door. You are not certain that it is smoke. It may be a special effect for the movie, such as a fog machine. When you are uncertain, you will tend to look at the behavior of others in the theater. If other people show concern and get up to leave, you are likely to do the same. However, if others seem unconcerned, you are likely to stay put and continue watching the movie. Question. Why does the professor mention the ash conformity studies? Based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either normative social influence or informational social influence. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. Now humans engage in aggression when they seek to cause harm or pain to another person. Aggression takes two forms depending on one's motives, hostile or instrumental. Hostile aggression is motivated by feelings of anger with intent to cause pain. A fight in a bar with a stranger is an example of hostile aggression. In contrast, instrumental aggression is motivated by achieving a goal and does not necessarily involve intent to cause pain. A contract killer who murders for hire displays instrumental aggression. Now, there are many different theories as to why aggression exists in the first place. Some researchers argue that aggression serves an evolutionary function. Men are more likely than women to show aggression. From the perspective of evolutionary psychology, human male aggression, like that in non-human primates, likely serves to display dominance over other males, both to protect a mate and to perpetuate the male's genes. Sexual jealousy is part of male aggression. Males endeavor to make sure their mates are not copulating with other males, thus ensuring their own paternity of the female's offspring. Although aggression provides an obvious evolutionary advantage for men, women also engage in aggression. Women typically display instrumental forms of aggression, with their aggression serving as a means to an end. Um, uh, for example, women may express their aggression covertly, for example, by communication that impairs the social standing of another person. Question. Based on the information from the listening, Indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either hostile aggression or instrumental aggression.
what is implied when the professor says this. Some researchers argue that aggression serves an evolutionary function. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. With the rapid growth of technology and widely available mobile technology and social networking media, a new form of bullying has emerged: cyberbullying. Cyberbullying, like bullying, is repeated behavior that is intended to cause psychological or emotional harm to another person. Now, what is unique about cyberbullying is that it is typically covert, concealed,、uh, done in private, and the bully can remain anonymous. This anonymity gives the bully power, and the victim may feel helpless, unable to escape the harassment, and unable to retaliate. Cyberbullying can take many forms, including harassing a victim by spreading rumors, creating a website defaming the victim, and ignoring, insulting, laughing at, or teasing the victim. In cyberbullying, it is more common for girls to be the bullies and victims because cyberbullying is non-physical and is a less direct form of bullying. Interestingly, girls who become cyberbullies often have been the victims of cyberbullying at one time. The effects of cyberbullying are just as harmful as traditional bullying, and include the victim feeling frustration, anger, sadness, helplessness, powerlessness, and fear. Victims will also experience lower self-esteem. Furthermore, recent research suggests that both cyberbullying victims and perpetrators are more likely to have ideas of suicide, and they are more likely to attempt suicide than individuals who have no experience with cyberbullying. Question: What is the professor's opinion of cyberbullying? Why are girls more likely to engage in cyberbullying? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. Now, caste systems are closed stratification systems in which people can do little or nothing to change their social standing. People are born into their social standing and will remain in it their whole lives. Individuals are assigned occupations regardless of their talents, interests, or potential. There are virtually no opportunities to improve one's social position. In the Hindu caste tradition, people were expected to work in the occupation of their caste and to enter into marriage according to their caste. Accepting this social standing was considered a moral duty. Cultural values reinforced the system. Caste systems promote beliefs in fate, destiny, and the will of a higher power. Rather than promoting individual freedom as a value, 
a person who lived in a caste society was raised to accept his or her social standing. Now, although the caste system in India has been officially dismantled, its residual presence in Indian society is deeply embedded. In rural areas, aspects of the tradition are more likely to remain, while urban centers show less evidence of this past. In India's larger cities, people now have more opportunities to choose their own career paths and marriage partners. As a global center of employment, corporations have introduced merit-based hiring and employment to the nation. Question. Which is considered part of the Hindu caste tradition? What is the professor's attitude towards the caste tradition? Directions Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. Ageism is discrimination based on age. Ageist attitudes and biases based on stereotypes reduce elderly people to inferior or limited positions. When ageism is reflected in the workplace, in healthcare, and in assisted living facilities, the effects of discrimination can be more severe. Ageism can make older people fear losing a job, feel dismissed by a doctor, or feel a lack of power and control in their daily living situations. Now, in early societies, the elderly were respected and revered. Many pre-industrial societies observed gerontocracy, a type of social structure wherein the power is held by a society's oldest members. In some countries today, the elderly still have influence and power and their vast knowledge is respected. In many modern nations, however, industrialization contributed to the diminished social standing of the elderly. In agrarian societies, a married couple cared for their aging parents. The oldest members of the family contributed to the household by doing chores, cooking, and helping with childcare. As economics shifted from agrarian to industrial, Younger generations moved to cities to work in factories. The elderly began to be seen as an expensive burden. They did not have the strength and stamina to work outside the home. What began during industrialization, a trend toward older people living apart from their grown children, has become commonplace. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? What was the role of elderly in agrarian societies?
Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. Americans typically equate marriages with monogamy, when someone is married to only one person at a time. In many countries and cultures around the world, however, having one spouse is not the only form of marriage. In a majority of cultures, 78% actually, polygamy, or being married to more than one person at a time, is accepted, with most polygamous societies existing in Northern Africa and East Asia. Now, instances of polygamy are almost exclusively in the form of polygyny. Polygyny refers to a man being married to more than one woman at the same time. The reverse, when a woman is married to more than one man at the same time, is called polyandry. It is far less common and only occurs in about 1% of the world's cultures. The reasons for the overwhelming prevalence of polygamous societies are varied, but they often include issues of population growth, religious ideologies, and social status. Question. Why does the professor say this? Americans typically equate marriages with monogamy, when someone is married to only one person at a time. Why does the professor discuss the difference between polygyny and polyandry? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. Throughout history and in societies across the world, leaders have used religious narratives, symbols, and traditions in an attempt to give more meaning to life and understand the universe. Some form of religion is found in every known culture, and it is usually practiced in a public way by a group. Now, while some people think of religion as something individual because religious beliefs can be highly personal, religion is also a social institution. Social scientists recognize that religion exists as an organized and integrated set of beliefs, behaviors, and norms centered on basic social needs and values. Moreover, religion is a cultural universal found in all social groups. Uh, for instance, in every culture, Funeral rites are practiced in some way, although these customs vary between cultures and within religious affiliations. Despite differences, there are common elements in a ceremony marking a person's death, such as announcement of the death, care of the deceased, and ceremony or ritual. These universals and the differences in how societies and individuals experience religion provide rich material for sociological study. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor discuss funeral rites?
Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. So, as already mentioned, education is not solely concerned with the basic academic concepts that a student learns in the classroom. Societies also educate their children outside of the school system in matters of everyday practical living. These two types of learning are referred to as formal education and informal education. Now, formal education describes the learning of academic facts and concepts through a formal curriculum, arising from the tutelage of ancient Greek thinkers. Centuries of scholars have examined topics through formalized methods of learning. Education in earlier times was only available to the higher classes. They had the means for access to scholarly materials, plus the luxury of leisure time that could be used for learning. The Industrial Revolution and its accompanying social changes made education more accessible to the general population. Many families in the emerging middle class found new opportunities for schooling. The modern U.S. educational system is the result of this progression. Today, basic education is considered a right and responsibility for all citizens. Expectations of this system focus on formal education. With curricula and testing designed to ensure that students learn the facts and concepts that society believes are basic knowledge. In contrast, informal education describes learning about cultural values, norms, and expected behaviors by participating in a society. This type of learning occurs both through the formal education system and at home. Our earliest learning experiences generally happen via parents, relatives, and others in our community. Through informal education, we learn how to dress for different occasions, how to perform regular life routines like shopping for and preparing food, and how to keep our bodies clean. Question: What is the professor's opinion of informal education? What is implied about informal education from the lecture? All right, you're doing great. Keep it up. You're at the halfway point. Take a break. Take a breather. Get some water. Get a snack. Let's go for this next hour. You got, you got one more hour left, and I know you can do it.、Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to TSTPrep.com. You know, a lot of students ask how we help students. Well, we found that there are four main types of students. The first student has less than a month to prepare. And in this case, we have the TOEFL Emergency Course, which you can actually finish in as little as three days. But it gives you enough practice to fill for about a month. And so that's the first student that we help is students in a hurry. The second type of student has more than a month to prepare for the TOEFL. And in this case, we have the Score Builder Program, which has practice activities, practice tests, and even more video lectures. To help students who are preparing more long term, so you have something to do every day. You know what to practice every day. You know what videos to watch every day. It pretty much has everything you need to prepare for this test. The third type of student needs to improve their English, and they have less than a month to do it and prepare for the test. Now, this type of student, we don't help. So,、uh, sorry if you need to improve your English in less than a month. In our opinion, we think it's kind of impossible. Uh, so yeah, so unfortunately, we don't have anything if you're in that situation. The fourth type of student has more than a month to prepare, has to improve their English, 
and also has to improve their TOEFL score. And this is where our teachers and classes and courses all come together. So you work with teachers, uh, you have a lot of practice to do every day, and you get feedback on your speaking and your writing, which is so necessary to improve your score. You need to get that feedback. And we've helped lots of students at, at different levels, at different stages in their life. So no matter what your situation, be confident that we can help. So check it out, tsdprep.com. Uh, but let's get into the second half of this TOEFL listening practice, questions and answers. Remember, you can check your answers in the PDF in the description if you need more help, if you need more explanation for these questions and why the answer is correct. That's it. Good luck, and I'll see you at the end. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Scientists use the term bioenergetics to describe the concept of energy flow through living systems, such as cells. Cellular processes, such as the building and breaking down of complex molecules, occur through stepwise chemical reactions. Some of these chemical reactions are spontaneous and release energy, whereas others require energy to proceed. Just as living things must continually consume food to replenish their energy supplies, cells must continually produce more energy to replenish that which is used by the energy-requiring chemical reactions that constantly take place. Together, all of the chemical reactions that take place inside cells, including those that consume or generate energy, are referred to as the cell's metabolism. Question. What is the professor mainly discussing? Two, what is referred to as the cell's metabolism? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Now, as organisms adapted to life on land, they had to contend with several challenges in the terrestrial environment. Water has been described as the stuff of life. The cell's interior is a watery soup. In this medium, most small molecules dissolve, and the majority of the chemical reactions of metabolism take place. Drying out is a constant danger for an organism exposed to air. Even when parts of a plant are close to a source of water, the aerial structures are likely to dry out. Water also provides buoyancy to organisms. On land, plants need to develop structural support in a medium that does not give the same lift as water. The organism is also subject to radiation because air does not filter out ultraviolet rays of sunlight. Additionally, the male gametes, the male cell that is able to unite with the opposite sex in sexual reproduction, must reach the female gametes using new strategies, because swimming is no longer possible. The successful land plants developed strategies to deal with all of these challenges. Not all adaptations appeared at once. Some species never moved very far from the aquatic environment, whereas others went on to conquer the driest environments on Earth. Question. What does the professor imply about supporting plant life on land?
Why does the professor say this? Water has been described as the stuff of life. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. The goal of homeostasis is the maintenance of equilibrium around a specific value of some aspect of the body or its cells called a set point. While there are normal fluctuations from the set point, the body's systems will usually attempt to go back to this point. A change in the internal or external environment is called a stimulus and is detected by a receptor. The response of the system is to adjust the activities of the system so the value moves back toward the set point. For instance, if the body becomes too warm, adjustments are made to cool the animal. If glucose levels in the blood rise after a meal, adjustments are made to lower them and to get the nutrient into tissues that need it. Now, when a change occurs in an animal's environment, an adjustment must be made so that the internal environment of the body and cells remains stable. The receptor that senses the change in the environment is part of a feedback mechanism. The stimulus, temperature, glucose, or calcium levels, is detected by the receptor. The receptor sends information to a control center, often the brain, which relays appropriate signals to an organ that is able to cause an appropriate change, either up or down, depending on the information the sensor was sending. Question: What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor mention glucose levels in the blood? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Community dynamics are the changes in community structure and composition over time, often following environmental disturbances such as volcanoes, earthquakes,、uh, storms, fires, and climate change. Communities with a relatively constant number of species are said to be at equilibrium. The equilibrium between species identities and relationships changes over time, but maintains a relatively constant number. Following a disturbance, the community may or may not return to the equilibrium state. Succession describes the sequential appearance and disappearance of species in a community over time after a severe disturbance. In primary succession, newly exposed or newly formed rock is colonized by living organisms. In secondary succession, a part of an ecosystem is disturbed and remnants of the previous community remain. In both cases, there is a sequential change in species until a more or less permanent community develops. Question: What is the lecture mainly about?
based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either primary succession or secondary succession. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. Adaptive immunity is defined by two important characteristics, specificity and memory. Specificity refers to the adaptive immune system's ability to target specific pathogens, and memory refers to its ability to quickly respond to pathogens to which it has previously been exposed. For example, when an individual recovers from chickenpox, the body develops a memory of the infection that will specifically protect it from the virus if it is exposed to it again later. Specificity and memory are achieved by essentially programming certain cells involved in the immune system to respond rapidly to subsequent exposures of the pathogen. This programming occurs as a result of the first exposure to a pathogen, which triggers a primary response. Later exposures result in a secondary response that is faster and stronger as a result of the body's memory of the first exposure. This secondary response, however, is specific to the pathogen in question. For example, exposure to one virus, like chickenpox, will not provide protection against other viral diseases. Question. Why is a secondary response faster and stronger than a primary response? Why does the professor say this? For example, exposure to one virus, like chickenpox, will not provide protection against other viral diseases. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. The story of modern economic growth can be told by looking at calorie consumption over time. The dramatic rise in incomes allowed the average person to eat better and consume more calories. So how did these incomes increase? Well, the period of modern economic growth came about because of the way in which technological progress combined with physical and human capital rapidly expanded. Although distribution of income is still an issue, it is clear that the average worker can afford more calories in 2014 than in 1875. Now, aside from increases in income, there is another reason why the average person can afford more food. Modern agriculture has allowed many countries to produce more food than they need, Despite having more than enough food, however, many governments and agencies have not solved the food distribution problem. In fact, food shortages, famine, or general food insecurity are caused more often by the failure of government macroeconomic policy, according to the Nobel Prize-winning economist Amartya Sen. Sen has conducted extensive research into the issues of inequality, 
poverty, and the role of government in improving standards of living. Macroeconomic policies that strive toward stable inflation, full employment, education of women, and preservation of property rights are more likely to eliminate starvation and provide for a more even distribution of food. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? According to the lecture, what would create a better distribution of food? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. Unemployment can be a terrible life experience, like a serious automobile accident or a messy divorce, whose consequences can be fully understood only by someone who has gone through it. For unemployed individuals and their families, there is the day-to-day -day financial stress of not knowing where the next paycheck is coming from. There are painful adjustments, like watching your savings account decrease, selling a car and buying a cheaper one, or moving to a less expensive place to live. Even when the unemployed person finds a new job, it may pay less than the previous one. For many people, their job is an important part of their self-worth. When unemployment separates people from the workforce, it can affect family relationships as well as mental and physical health. The human costs of unemployment alone would justify making a low level of employment an important public policy priority. But unemployment also includes economic costs to the broader society. When millions of unemployed but willing workers cannot find jobs, an economic resource is going unused. An economy with high unemployment is like a company operating with a functional but unused factory. The opportunity cost of unemployment is the output that could have been produced by the unemployed workers. Question: What is the professor's opinion of unemployment? What is implied when the professor says this? The human costs of unemployment alone would justify making a low level of employment an important public policy priority. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. The natural rate of unemployment is not natural in the sense that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. It is not a physical and unchanging law of nature. Instead, it is only the natural rate, 
because it is the unemployment rate that would result from the combination of economic, social, and political factors that exist at a given time, assuming the economy was neither booming nor in recession. Now, these forces include the usual pattern of companies expanding their workforce as they would in a booming economy or contracting it as they would during a recession. Also, keep in mind the social and economic forces that affect the labor market or the public policies that affect either the eagerness of people to work or the willingness of businesses to hire. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? What would most likely happen to unemployment during a recession? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. Perhaps no economy around the world is better known for its trade surpluses than Japan. Since 1990, the size of these surpluses has often been near $100 billion per year. When Japan's economy was growing vigorously in the 1960s and the 1970s, Its large trade surpluses were often described, especially by non economists, as either a cause or a result of its economic health. But, from a standpoint of economic growth, Japan's economy has been in and out of recession since 1990, with real gross domestic product growth averaging only about 1% per year and an unemployment rate that has been creeping higher. Clearly, a trade surplus is no guarantee of economic good health. Instead, Japan's trade surplus reflects that Japan has a very high rate of domestic savings, more than the Japan economy can invest in domestically, and so the extra funds are invested abroad. Now, in Japan's slow economy, the growth of consumption is relatively low, which also means that consumption of imports is relatively low. Thus, Japan's exports continually exceed its imports, leaving the trade surplus continually high. Question Why are Japan's large trade surpluses not representative of its economy? Why does the professor say this? Perhaps no economy around the world is better known for its trade surpluses than Japan. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. Now, the balance of trade, or trade balance, 
is any gap between a nation's value of its exports, or what its producers sell abroad, and its total dollar value of imports, or the foreign-made products and services that households and businesses purchase. If exports exceed imports, the economy is said to have a trade surplus. If imports exceed exports, the economy is said to have a trade deficit. If exports and imports are equal, then trade is balanced. But what happens when trade is out of balance and large trade surpluses or deficits exist? So, Germany, for example, has had substantial trade surpluses in recent decades, in which exports have greatly exceeded imports. Germany ran a trade surplus of $260 billion. In contrast, the U.S. economy in recent decades has experienced large trade deficits, in which imports have considerably exceeded exports. In 2014, for example, U.S. imports exceeded exports by $539 billion. Now, a series of financial crises triggered by unbalanced trade can lead economies into deep recessions. These crises begin with large trade deficits. At some point, foreign investors become pessimistic about the economy and move their money to other countries. The economy then drops into deep recession. This happened to Mexico in 1995. A number of countries in East Asia, Thailand, South Korea, Malaysia, and Indonesia, came down with the same economic illness in 1997, which was referred to as the Asian financial crisis. Question. Why does the professor mention the Asian financial crisis? What is the example the professor uses when discussing Germany? Directions Now listen to part of a talk in a U.S. history class. Mesoamerica is the geographic area stretching from north of Panama up to the desert of central Mexico. Although marked by great diversity, this region cradled a number of civilizations with similar characteristics. Mesoamericans were polytheistic, which means they worshipped several gods, and these gods possessed both male and female traits and demanded blood sacrifices of enemies taken in battle or ritual bloodletting. Corn, or maize, domesticated by 5000 BCE, formed the basis of their diet. They developed a mathematical system, built huge edifices, and devised a calendar that accurately predicted eclipses and solstices and that priest astronomers used to direct the planting and harvesting of crops. We are able to learn so much about these people because they created the only known written language in the Western Hemisphere. Researchers have made much progress in interpreting the inscriptions on their temples and pyramids. Though the area had no overarching political structure, trade over long distances helped diffuse the culture. Question. What is the lecture mainly about?
What does the professor imply about Mesoamericans? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a U.S. history class. Thomas Edison patented the light bulb in 1879. This development quickly became common in homes as well as factories, transforming how even lower and middle-class Americans lived. Although slow to arrive in rural areas of the country. Electric power became readily available in cities when the first commercial power plants began to open in 1882. When Nikola Tesla developed the alternating current system for the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company, power supplies for lights and other factory equipment could extend for miles from the power source. Alternating current power transformed the use of electricity, allowing urban centers to physically cover greater areas. In the factories, electric lights permitted operations to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This increase in production required additional workers, and this demand brought more people to cities. Gradually, cities began to illuminate the streets with electric lamps to allow the city to remain alight throughout the night. No longer did the pace of life and economic activity slow substantially at sunset, the way it had in smaller towns. The cities, following the factories that drew people there, stayed open all night. Question: What is the lecture mainly about? Why did electricity help bring more people to cities? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a U.S. history class. The Progressive Era was a time of wide-ranging causes and varied movements, where activists and reformers from diverse backgrounds and with very different agendas pursued their goals of a better America. These reformers were reacting to the challenges that faced the country at the end of the 19th century: rapid urban growth,、uh, immigration. Corruption, industrial working conditions, the growth of large corporations, women's rights, and surging anti-black violence in the South. Investigative journalists of the day uncovered social inequality and encouraged Americans to take action. While different causes shared some underlying elements, each movement largely focused on its own goals. Be it the right of women to vote, the removal of alcohol from communities. Or the desire for a more democratic voting process. Over time, some progressive campaigns proved more successful than others. Question: What is the professor mainly discussing?
Why does the professor mention investigative journalists? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a U.S. history class. In the last decades of the 19th century, after the Civil War, the United States changed from a country that wanted to stay isolated from the rest of the world to one that wanted to expand American influence. The nation's earlier isolationism originated from the deep scars left by the Civil War and its need to recover both economically and mentally from that event. But as the Industrial Revolution changed the way the country worked and the American West reached its farthest point, American attitudes towards foreign expansion shifted. Businesses were looking for new markets to export their factory-built goods. Oil and tobacco products, as well as generous trade agreements to secure access to raw materials. Early social reformers saw opportunities to spread Christianity and the benefits of American life to those in less developed nations. The country moved quickly to ready itself for the creation of an American empire. Question: Why does the professor mention the Civil War? What is the professor's attitude towards the expansion of American influence? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a U.S. history class. On the eve of World War I, the U.S. government under President Woodrow Wilson opposed any involvement in international military conflicts. But as the war continued in Europe, and as some of the powers in the war began to target commerce and travel across the Atlantic Ocean. It became clear that the United States would not be able to maintain its position of neutrality. Still, the American public was of mixed opinion. Many resisted the idea of an American intervention and American lives lost, no matter how bad the circumstances. In 1918, artist George Bellows created a series of paintings intended to strengthen public support for the war effort. His paintings depicted German war atrocities in detail. From children run through with bayonets to torturers happily resting while their victims suffered, one image shows Germans unloading sick or disabled labor camp prisoners from a box car. These paintings were typical for anti-German propaganda at the time. The U.S. government sponsored much of this propaganda out of concern that many American immigrants sympathized with the Central Powers and would not support the U.S. war effort. In the end, it appears that some of this propaganda paid off. America officially announced its involvement on the sides of the British and French in April 1917, and would eventually send over two million American soldiers to join the war effort. Question: Why did the U.S. government want to get involved in the war in Europe?
What does the lecture imply about the people's support of American involvement in the war? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a world history class. Most scholars agree that the Ice Age played a fundamental role in the rise of agriculture. It was impossible during the much colder and often ice-covered period of the Pleistocene, but inevitable during the Holocene thawing. Only 4,000 years before the origins of agriculture, the planting of anything would have been extremely difficult. Not only were today's fertile farmlands of Spain or the North American Great Plains covered in ice, but also other areas around the world could not depend on constant temperatures or rainfall from year to year. Pleistocene foragers had to be flexible. The warming trend of the Holocene, by contrast, resulted in consistent rainfall amounts and more predictable temperatures. This alteration in habitat could have led to the extinction of megafauna, like mammoths. In the Pleistocene age, humans hunted these large beasts and relied on them for food. Therefore, as animal populations declined, humans were further encouraged to plant and cultivate seeds in newly thawed soil. Question: What encouraged humans to plant and cultivate seeds? Why does the professor mention the Pleistocene period? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a world history class. Confucius lived just prior to the Warring States period. What little we know about his life comes primarily from the Analects, a record of conversations Confucius held with his students compiled after he died. In later centuries, in China, Confucius was revered as a sage, and even today, outside of China. Some people might think of him as a strict teacher. However, in the context of his time, Confucius was anything but stiff, and rather a dynamic individual who believed he was mandated by heaven to return the world to a more socially and politically harmonious time. The Analects not only shows a serious and learned man, but also someone capable in archery and horsemanship, who loved music and ritual. And who untiringly traveled the feudal states in the hopes of serving as an aid to various landowners. Question: What is the lecture mainly about?
What does the professor imply about Confucius? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a world history class. The Prophet Muhammad started publicly preaching his strict brand of monotheism in the year 613 by reciting the Quran, quickly convincing some of the commoners of Mecca to believe in him. Most of his early converts belonged to groups of people who had failed to achieve any significant social mobility, which, of course, included many of the poor. His followers memorized his recitations and message that called for the powerful to take care of the weak, a message that resonated with many of these economically and socially marginalized. Muhammad's message challenged the Umayyad's clan leadership of society. The most powerful branch of the Quraysh tribe, the Umayyads had been enriching themselves from the lucrative caravan trade, while at the same time ignoring the hardships of the needy. The political implications were clear. The Muslims threatened to disrupt a delicate equilibrium. The Prophet's message jeopardized the social and economic standing of the elite members of society. Question: Why does the professor discuss the Umayyad clan? What does the professor mean when she says this? The political implications were clear. The Muslims threatened to disrupt a delicate equilibrium. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a world history class. Although the 11th century was in many ways Western Europe's lowest point, it would also see the beginnings of Western Europe's reurbanization. One reason for these beginnings was that in those lands that had been part of the Western Roman Empire, city walls often remained, even if these cities had largely emptied of people. During the chaos and mayhem of the 10th and 11th centuries, people often gathered in walled settlements for protection. Many of these old walled cities thus came to be reoccupied. Another reason for the growth of towns came with a revival of trade in the 11th century. This revival of trade can be traced to several causes. In the first place, Europe's knights, as a warrior aristocracy, had such a strong demand for luxury goods, both locally manufactured products and imported goods such as silks and spices from Asia. Bishops, the great lords of the church, had a similar demand. As such, markets grew up in the areas around castles and churches, and thus caused the formation of towns that served as market centers. Moreover, Viking raids had also led to a greater seaborne trade in the North Sea and Atlantic. Often, Viking-founded markets served as the center of new towns, especially in those lands where the Romans had never established a state and which were not urbanized at all. The Irish city of Dublin, for example, had begun as a Viking trading post. 
Question: What is the professor's opinion of Western Europe in the 11th century? Why does the professor mention the Irish city of Dublin? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a world history class. When England's King John lost to Philip Augustus, his outraged nobles rebelled, resulting in a civil war from 1215 to 1217. One temporary treaty of this civil war, a treaty known as Magna Carta, would have a much further-reaching impact than anyone who had drafted it could have foreseen. One particular provision of Magna Carta was that if the king wanted to raise new taxes on the people of England, then he needed to get the consent of the community by conveying a council. The conveying of such councils, known as parliaments, would come to be systemized over the course of the 13th century. Parliaments were not unique to England, however. Most Spanish kings would consult with representatives of both Spain's towns and nobility, and the Scandinavian kings had assemblies. England's parliaments, however, would gradually evolve from meetings assembled when a king wanted to raise taxes to a regular assembly that gave representative voice to the people of England. Question: What is the professor mainly discussing? What does the professor imply about the Magna Carta Treaty? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a physics class. Much of what we value in life is fluid: a breath of fresh winter air, the hot blue flame in our gas cooker, the water we drink, swim in, and bathe in, the blood in our veins. So, what exactly is a fluid? Matter most commonly exists as a solid, liquid, or gas. These states are known as the three common phases of matter. Now, solids have a definite shape and a specific volume. Liquids have a definite volume, but their shape changes depending on the container in which they are held. And gases have neither a definite shape nor a specific volume as their molecules move to fill the container in which they are held. Liquids and gases are considered to be fluids because they yield to shearing forces. Whereas solids resist them, 
a container, for example, is a shearing force, since it forces liquids and gases to change shape based on its dimensions. Solids don't change based on their container. Atoms and solids are in close contact, with forces between them that allow the atoms to vibrate but not to change positions with neighboring atoms. Thus, a solid resists all types of stress. In contrast, liquids change easily when stressed and do not spring back to their original shape once the force is removed because the atoms are free to slide about and change neighbors. That is, they flow with the molecules held together by their mutual attraction. Atoms and gases are separated by distances that are large compared with the size of the atoms. The forces between gas atoms are therefore very weak, except when the atoms collide with one another. Gases thus not only flow, but they are relatively easy to compress because there is much space and little force between atoms. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? Based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either solid, liquid, or gas. Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a physics class. Pressure is defined as force per unit area. Can pressure be increased in a fluid by pushing directly on the fluid? Yes, but it is much easier if the fluid is enclosed. The heart, for example, increases blood pressure by pushing directly on the blood in an enclosed system. If you try to push on a fluid in an open system, such as a river, the fluid flows away. An enclosed fluid cannot flow away, and so pressure is more easily increased by an applied force. Now, what happens to a pressure in an enclosed fluid? Since atoms in a fluid are free to move about, they transmit the pressure to all parts of the fluid and to the walls of the container. Remarkably, the pressure is transmitted undiminished. This phenomenon is called Pascal's principle because it was first clearly stated by the 17th century French philosopher and scientist Blase Pascal. A change in pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to all portions of the fluid and to the walls of its container. Pascal's principle is what makes pressure so important to fluids. Since a change in pressure is transmitted undiminished in an enclosed fluid, we often know more about pressure than other physical quantities in fluids. Question. What is the professor's opinion of Pascal's principle? Why does the professor mention the heart?
Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a physics class. The concept of temperature has evolved from the common concepts of hot and cold. Human perception of what feels hot or cold is a relative one. For example, if you place one hand in hot water and the other in cold water, and then place both hands in tepid water, the tepid water will feel cool to the hand that was in hot water and warm to the one that was in cold water. The scientific definition of temperature is less ambiguous than your senses of hot and cold. Temperature is operationally defined to be what we measure with a thermometer. Two accurate thermometers, one placed in hot water and the other in cold water, will show the hot water to have a higher temperature. If they are then placed in the tepid water, both will give identical readings. Again, just to reiterate, temperature is the quantity measured by a thermometer. Now, any physical property that depends on temperature and whose response to temperature is reproducible can be used as the basis of a thermometer. Because many physical properties depend on temperature, the variety of thermometers is remarkable. For example, volume increases with temperature for most substances. This property is the basis for the common alcohol thermometer, the old mercury thermometer, and the bimetallic strip. Other properties used to measure temperature include electrical resistance and color, and the emission of infrared radiation. Question. Why does the professor say this? Again, just to reiterate, temperature is the quantity measured by a thermometer. What is the professor's attitude towards thermometers? Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a physics class. Sound can be used as a familiar illustration of waves. Because hearing is one of our most important senses, it is interesting to see how the physical properties of sound correspond to our perceptions of it. Hearing is the perception of sound, just as vision is the perception of visible light. But sound has important applications beyond hearing. Ultrasound, for example, is not heard but can be employed to form medical images and is also used in treatment. The physical phenomenon of sound is defined to be a disturbance of matter that is transmitted from its source outward. Sound is a wave. On the atomic scale, it is a disturbance of atoms that is far more ordered than their thermal motions. In many instances, sound is a periodic wave and the atoms undergo simple harmonic motion. Question. What is the professor's opinion towards sound? Why does the professor mention ultrasound?
Directions. Now listen to part of a talk in a physics class. There are two known hazards of electricity: thermal and shock. A thermal hazard is one where excessive electric power causes undesired thermal effects. A classic example of this is the short circuit. Insulation on wires leading to an appliance has worn through, allowing the two wires to come into contact. This could start a fire in the wall of a house. A shock hazard occurs when electric current passes through a person. Electrical currents through people produce tremendously varied effects. An electrical current can even be used for positive effects, like to block back pain. The possibility of using electrical currents to stimulate muscle action in paralyzed limbs, perhaps allowing paraplegics to walk, is also under study. Still, many in the general public think of electric current running through the body as both dangerous and potentially fatal. The major factors upon which the effects of electric shock depend are the amount of the current, the path taken by the current, the duration of the current, and the strength of the current. Question: What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor say this? A classic example of this is the short circuit. Insulation on wires leading to an appliance has worn through, allowing the two wires to come into contact. All right, congratulations! You have made it to the end of this two hours of TOEFL listening practice. You did it! Congratulate yourself. Millions of other things you could be doing, but you took the time to prepare for this test. That's exactly the type of attitude and the type of work you have to do to get your score. So I'm really proud of you. Congratulations! And remember, when I talk to students and I ask them, "What's your regret? Why?" Didn't you get your score? What could you have done differently? And they always tell me the same thing. They say, "Josh, I should have subscribed to your channel sooner." So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Check out tstprep.com if you need more help, and you can get a free and complete practice test, which is just like what you'll see on test day. But that's it. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, you're still here. Awesome.、Uh, check out this next video. I think you're gonna like it.